Morris Berman is an acclaimed author, academic, and cultural historian. He has written numerous books, of which I will link to. You can find his commentary on his blog at morrisberman.blogspot.com. It's great to hear from you again, Dr. Berman. Thanks for the invitation. I think this is the third interview we've done, which is great. Yes, it is indeed. Um, once when I visited you in uh, Guanajuato, the other time with my university class, and here we go. Yeah, I remember that, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and today we'll continue our declinist discussion, or post-mortem of the United States, as you, as you call it, both of us comfortably located uh, on the outskirts of the empire. Thank so, God. <laughs> uh, so let's start by talking about uh, both of the candidates. You sent me a piece from La Jornada that said both Clinton and Trump were an expression of the same oligarchic or imperialist power system in the United States. Another academic I respect, the Swiss historian Daniele Ganser, said that both are a threat to world peace and that the military-industrial Wall Street complex would continue unabated. How is this election not different from any other? Well, it's, it is the same in the sense that the, the regime that uh, America pursues, which is uh, economic and technological expansion and domination of the globe and so on, that will continue. I mean, uh, it falls within the larger framework of a socioeconomic arrangement known as capitalism, and we are the cutting edge of it, and uh, that will certainly continue. Uh, there's no question about that. In that sense, it's just more of the same. And really, uh, you know, um, in in my book, uh, Why America Failed, I pointed out that all of this began uh, in the late 16th century. I mean, we've been doing this for 400 years. The possibility of... Um, a very different type of candidate, which Bernie Sanders was not. He was not a, a very different. He was sort of a Franklin Roosevelt type figure, you know. But Franklin Roosevelt is famous for saving capitalism, after all. So it's all it's all the same, and in that sense, it didn't really make any difference who got elected. Um, the the major difference I saw was, uh, you know. Um, October 19th was the uh, second presidential debate. And in uh, Mexico City, there's a restaurant that I didn't know about, but apparently is frequented by American expats um, called <laughs> Pinche Gringo. <laughs> and uh, so they have set, they had set up a number of television screens and they invited about 200 people in the press. I guess Azteca was there, and Reforma. And uh, so people could watch that very boring debate for an hour and a half. And then they told me they wanted me to give a talk on U.S. politics. Uh, but when I got there, uh, actually, they had something very different in mind. It was that I was on a panel with uh, two other people. One was, um, well, I forget his name. This is really embarrassing. Zoe. Uh, Zoe is his first name. Uh, the senator from Chiapas and another was a professor at a university in Mexico City uh, Etam I think and um, so the idea was that we would three of us were on a panel and uh, we would uh, comment on how the debate went so the talk that I had prepared <coughs> excuse me was not really one I could give um, but the title that I had had in mind was finally the class war is out in the open. And uh, to the extent that I could during uh, the various commentary that went on for about the next hour after the debate, uh, I got in as much as I could of the talk I had prepared. But the uh, main point that I wanted to make, which I'd been making for a while now, was that this really was um, a class war, that um, that Trump although he's a billionaire, he claimed at least to represent people who had been crushed and destroyed and stepped on by administrations that ran from uh, Bill Clinton through, um, um, but, you know, Bush Jr., through Obama, through 
and now presumably through Hillary and uh, everybody. Uh, I, I think, you know, the uh, liberals and Democrats really fail to understand uh, the depth of the resentment toward them uh, that had gone on. And here was a candidate who was spouting all the appropriate stuff, Hillary Clinton, but everybody understood that it was just going to be more the same. It was going to be a continuation of the same neoliberal globalized uh, regime that had destroyed the lower class and the lower middle class. And so when Trump said things like, you know, you can listen to Hillary, but it's all words, just words. He was right. And when he said, if you want a continuation of the Obama regime, she's your man, vote for her. And so I think that uh, this this really was, you know, a very different election because finally you had uh, all these people that had been kicked around by an economic system that had been in place at least since the fall of the Soviet Union, if not before, um, were saying enough of this. We're not tolerating this anymore. And so it was a very, uh, you know, remarkable but significant uh, election in the sense that it was a rejection of what had gone on uh, for a long time. Uh, that would be, I mean, there's a lot more to say about the election, but that would that was what I was trying to uh, say at that um, at that uh, meeting at uh, Pinche Gringo on October 19th that. Uh, what we, what we really had now was the open declaration of class war. I've also said uh, in the past that uh, with no socialist tradition in the United States, it's very little. There's, it was very unlikely that there was going to be any kind of left-wing revolution, but it was very likely there was going to be a right-wing revolution. And that's what that election represented. Of course, it was through the ballot box, but revolutionary enough. It took everybody by surprise, or most people. And I would have to say that if Mr. Trump doesn't deliver on his promises, especially with regard to jobs, you know, for you know, economic relief for the people that were destroyed by uh, the people that Hillary Clinton represented, if he doesn't make good on that... Um, the, the people that voted for him are going to be very, very angry. And they also have guns. They collect arsenals. And uh, this could be a very interesting, I use that word in quotes, development uh, for the United States. And, and again, it's nice that we're both uh, on, situated on the outskirts. <laughs> um, but uh, something you mentioned as well, it's a class, class war. And I recently discovered Peter Turchin's Age of Discord, which uh, confirms what you say, that one of the main problems of this political upheaval is elites over production and this severe uh, inequality. Um, I've been listening to Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek's interviews uh, on the election. And him being one of the preeminent leftists, he said he would have voted for Trump who is a lesser global, global threat to peace or lesser evil than Hillary Clinton, and that at least Trump would shake the, the system and status quo. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't vote, so it didn't really matter. And if I um, did want to vote, I would have to vote, uh, you know, um, in absentia, uh, but through uh, Washington, D.C., which is where I last lived. And uh, that's not a swing state. It's 95% Democratic. So there's no, it didn't matter whether I voted or not. Um, but yes, I mean, I was relieved, uh, shocked, but relieved as well when I woke up in a hotel room in Germany <laughs> the morning of November 9th to discover that Trump had won. Um, of course, that shakeup that Zizek refers to could be a very dangerous shakeup. It could be a, a shakeup that we don't want. Um, and, uh, that's certainly a real possibility, but, um, the, uh, especially if we're going to discuss foreign policy, um, Hillary would have been a disaster. Um, she's a warmonger, you know, I mean, she's a saber rattler and that's how she would, uh, get her prestige 
from opposing Putin and um, generally creating problems in the world. Uh, and um, th I think that uh, Trump, uh, I don't believe for a minute that he was a puppet of Putin, as Hillary claimed. Uh, that was totally dishonest. Uh, but um, I think he'll have a better relationship with the Russians uh, than Hillary would have. And uh, although, you know, he claims he's going to destroy ISIS and so on, um, I don't see him as somebody who wants uh, problems in the sphere of U.S. foreign politics, uh, whereas Hillary did. Um, and uh, there, you know, we, we have to really address that, as Zizek did, that um, at least, I mean, not on the domestic front, but at least on the foreign front, um, this could be a lot better for the world uh, than a, um, a Hillary Clinton presidency. And Trump said he wouldn't prosecute uh, Hillary. Forecaster Martin Armstrong, who was illegally himself jailed by the government, he made a sober observation that it was probably the correct thing to do. Otherwise, it would have created a chaotic and even more destabilizing national and political situation. Do you think uh, it's a good idea not to prosecute Hillary or should we should she be sent to Guantanamo regardless of the political repercussions? Well, I felt uh, bad about his retreat from there because she's such an awful human being. You know, she and Bill are two of the sleaziest, uh, most aggrand self-aggrandizing uh, people that have ever existed on the planet. And her entire goal in being president was simply to be president. She didn't have any vision at all, any more than Obama did, really. And, um, I mean, what an awful human being Hillary is. But, uh, so it would, it would have been great to see her in jail. I mean, I would have enjoyed that. But I think that Trump probably did the right thing in the sense that, um, you know, I mean, during his campaign, there was a problem that he had of flying off the handle at Trivia. Um, you know, this, this girl who gained weight or the, the um, uh, Muslim family who had lost uh, their son uh, in Iraq in 2004 and so on. He would fly off the handle off of stuff that required a bit more maturity and self-control, and he didn't seem to have it. Um, but this uh, displays a kind of generosity that I think is necessary in a president when you say, uh, Hillary has suffered enough. I'm not going to pursue her in any way. Um, we we need to move on to things that are larger and more important because it really would have, although she definitely deserves uh, to uh, be jailed for a very long time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, letting bygones be bygones, I think, is the, is the higher road to take. And, uh, you know, he's showing some presidential characteristics now that he didn't during the campaign. And I've recently been catching up on the Netflix show House of Cards these last few months, and it's just uncanny the, the similarity between that show and, and what's, what's really going on. And um, I've been speaking to somebody who is from New York, from where the Clintons are, and they have confirmed to me that they know people who have worked in, you know, have been around the Clintons and that Hillary, she treats the people around her like crap, that she's literally throwing chairs and uh, throwing things at people. And I think there was a report recently about that. So not a you really... Mean, you mean post-election? Right, post-election, but even before the election, that in general, she would just treat people around her like, like, like crap, so... Um, yeah, not, it's it's not a surprise. I mean, it, it, you know, it was a quite an admission that was uh, significant. I thought. Uh, I don't think the press picked up on it enough. But in one of the debates, she said, uh, "There's a public me and a private me," mm -hmm. and um, it was that my remark was made in the context of being challenged to release the transcripts of the lectures that she gave to Goldman Sachs. And, you know, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that she's going to tell the folks at Goldman Sachs one thing, 
and she's going to tell the voters, the, the public, something very different. And uh, the the folks at Goldman Sachs are her her pals, her buddies, fellow billionaires like Lloyd Blankfein. And I would trust much more what she said to Goldman Sachs than what she said in public. And, um, you know, and what she said to Goldman Sachs was your money is safe. My money is safe. We're in the saddle. We're running things. And everybody else is a basket of deplorables. You know, I mean, this wholesale contempt, um, it, it's, a. Uh, She's just a remarkable person in the most negative way imaginable. You said uh, another point on on Trump. Um, you said you believe he would accelerate the the internal domestic collapse. Um, what are what are some of his? What do you think of some of his seemingly promising appointments? He's looked at representative uh, from Hawaii, Tulsi Gabbard, who is very uh, anti-war. Or Michael Flynn, who exposed how the U.S. was um, assisting ISIS, as well as Trump is against the TTP um, uh, or TPP. And uh, I mean, what what do you think is going to happen with him? Is he going to accelerate the collapse, or is there hope, or is this that same false hope that we have every four years? No, I think this is this is more than this more than the same old same old. Every four years, this to me is the pro- very likely uh, the end of the American experiment. Um, it's been running for 400 years now. Uh, it's based on hustling. We finally elected the ultimate hustler, um, the guy whose life has entirely been about money and economic expansion and power. And um, there's no real place to go from here. I uh, feel that. Um, Increasingly, dissent is going to be very difficult. Uh, Trump is already haranguing the media about criticizing him. You know, if if the cast of Hamilton can't make a few remarks to the vice, you know, the vice president elect uh, without getting this strong reaction from the White House or the future White House, um, the he's not going to tolerate. Uh, very much dissent, and given the cowardice of the American media, um, they're going to fall into line. Uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post, they're going to fall into line. And I think that the possibility of um, a real kind of de facto fascism is upon us, and that the democratic experiment is basically over. Um, and um, it wasn't much of an experiment to begin with, in my opinion, because I really feel it was about hustling, you know, at, at its root. But uh, any pretense to it now, I think, uh, is shattered. And um, that uh, has, however, uh, some positive aspects in the larger world, which is to say that I think other nations now, with the election of somebody like Trump to the presidency, um, other nations and perhaps even our allies are now starting to think in terms of a post-American era that the United States is finished. It's really going to walk off the world stage. It's just not going to have the respect or influence that it once had and that uh, it's being eclipsed and we are you know, moving to a different type of uh, world where the United States doesn't have uh, the influence or prestige that it once did. And, you know, considering the genocide that the United States performs on a daily basis and the plutocracy that is running that genocide, um, that's a good thing. It's a good thing for the United States to step off the world stage, I think. I mean, it is truly amazing to be witnessing what is happening. You've written about it for for decades, but now we saw the Philippine President Duterte come out and literally announce the separate military and economic separation from the U.S. and the clear realignment with China. Other South uh, East Asian countries have been doing the same. Recently, France, it was reported that France and Iran made a deal uh, where they wouldn't use dollars uh, f- for their trade. And it's just, it's really happening right now. And 
anything else you can uh, mention on that post-American world uh, front? No, except, uh, well, just one one sort of PS, and that is that um, I would really uh, hope, as, as somebody who's lived in Mexico for more than 10 years and who loves the country, um, that this is an opportunity for Mexico to develop some very strong nationalism in opposition to the United States. Uh, you know, Vicente Fox was never a big hero of mine. I was never a great fan of Mr. Fox. But um, at the time that Trump said, I'm going to build a wall and I'm going to make Mexico pay for it, Fox responded by saying, I'm not paying for that frigging wall. And that's the type of energy we need in Mexico right now. Uh, I think uh, recently, uh, just a few days ago, um, Jorge Castaneda, um, who he now teaches at NYU, but he, I think from 2000 to 2003, he was Mexico's foreign minister. And he did an op-ed piece in the New York Times, and he said Mexico needs to fight back now. And I was really cheered to see a Mexican writing that. And I hope that he will write it in Spanish as well in Reforma and other papers that Mexico needs to stop this slavish imitation of the United States as being cool, hip, and avant-garde. It's not. It's a stupid, trashy civilization. It wrecks family, community, uh, meaningful work. Across the board, it's destructive. And it's done a lot of damage in uh, creating a hustler elite in Mexico, which is a very, to me, a very sad thing, and and destruction of values and so on. And uh, it's it's time for for Mexico to claim its own nationalism, and to basically, uh, in the same way that all those voters uh, for Trump uh, gave the finger to Hillary and then neoliberal establishment, Mexico needs to give the finger to the United States. We're not we're not paying for that frigging wall. You're not going to put up that wall. You put it up, put it up. We'll smash it. Um, we're not going to play ball with you anymore. Uh, I would like to see Mexico say that and act on it and um, uh, develop a real presence in the world as a separate civilization, uh, independent of American U.S. influence. You know. So you're saying there's a chance you won't get to write Dark Ages Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think Mexico has passed through enough Dark Ages and now needs to reach for a dawn. There will be no dawn in the United States. The United States is finished. But uh, Mexico has the possibility. I mean, the real problem right now, as, as Castaneda pointed out in this article, is that Peña Nieto has no spine. He's just appeasing Trump so far. You know, uh, he doesn't have the courage, uh, like Vicente Fox did, uh, to say, go to hell. Um, and we need leaders now, Mexican leaders, not just in um, Los Pinos, but we need Mexican leaders now to stand up and say, you know, ya basta, enough with the United States. We're somebody else, and we're going to be somebody else. And I'd like to see that happen. I mean, I don't know what the, what the odds are, because... Uh, you know, I always come back to that quote from Porfirio Diaz when he said that the United States, uh, Mexico is too close to the United States, uh, too far from God and too close to the United States. Well, it is too close to the United States, but it can, um, that geographical closeness doesn't have to translate into this kind of slavish uh, uh, younger brother, or whatever it is, uh, you know, uh, mm, the United States' backyard, so to speak, as one assistant ambassador. I think it was under Fox actually said and subsequently got fired because you're not supposed to say that, especially since it's the truth. But now it's time not to be a backyard. Mexico, and I say we, we have our own uh, yard, and it's a fine yard, and it's a great history, and it goes on for thousands of years, unlike this you know, 200-year experiment with the United States, which didn't work out very well. Um, it just needs to reclaim all that, I think. And I, I really hope that happens. And uh, around the world now, as you pointed out, countries are recognizing that maybe we shouldn't be doing business in dollars. Maybe uh, we shouldn't be 
so excited about the United States. And, you know, I think, I think that eclipse is taking place. And I, I see it here uh, as long, you know, the years that I've been here, this slavish uh, copying uh, of the U.S., I feel like Mexico is suppressing its and the Mexican people who follow the American dream are suppressing their own potential. And if they would just think outside the box, think for themselves, take take the reins, there's just so much opportunity and, and things that they can do. And, you know, I'm, I'm being surprised now on that last point you mentioned that people that I, Mexicans now are telling me that they refuse now to go on vacation or shopping to the United States. Like it's, Good it's, for them. it's Good not even, for them. it's not even a joke. I mean, they're going to go to Canada or maybe they'll travel around, travel around Mexico, but it's, it's across the board here. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's a positive development and I hope it expands, you know, I mean, it really comes down to a question of values and I've talked about that a lot with regard to you know what are the values of the United States that's pretty thin it's pretty thin there was a, a book by um, a um, Moroccan writer that I like Tahar Benjaloun called A Place in the Old Village and it's about a you know older Moroccan guy who in his youth went to France because the opportunities for making money were better and uh, so, you know, France do, did a lot of things in the sense of uh, there's free education and uh, free medical care and types of things you don't find in the United States, but France, you know, had made those available. Um, but he lost his entire family. He had five kids and they all drifted. Or they became French and they all drifted off into um, the girls wearing uh, very you know, scanty outfits and running around with guys that weren't the best types of guys to be running around with. And, uh, the sons are into making money. And, um, he, uh, realizes that the trade-off hasn't been good, that what he got out of France was material benefits, but what he lost was everything he cared about. And this is, uh, the theme, you know, also, uh, we've talked about this before, the theme also of that film McFarland USA with Kevin Costner, where he begins to realize that all the United States ever really offered was the American dream, and the American dream is about money. And when he lives in this 100% Hispanic town, McFarland, in the Central Valley of California, uh, he begins to see uh, how Mexicans and Chicanos live, uh, the importance of family, the importance of community, uh, the importance of trying to find meaningful work, all these types of values. Um, the values of the United States, I mean, if you put aside democracy, which I regard as basically lip service and not real, but the values of the United States are shabby. And the values of countries like Mexico and Morocco that have you know, all these traditional structures, these are the types of things that go to the deepest parts of the human soul. And the trade-off, I mean, the central character of this Moroccan novel uh, finds out that the trade-off wasn't worth it. And um, I think a lot of Mexicans, I hope, are realizing that um, our values, our Mexican values, are much better than U.S. values, much superior. And uh, talking on a more practical, uh, pragmatic level, talking about a post-Trump America, apart from some of those of us uh, that have left, uh, what do you think w needs to happen now for, for, for uh, after four or, well, eight years, whatever happens? You know, I, I, I must say, I must admit, I see eye to eye with the libertarians and a number of issues, but I think Gary Johnson just destroyed the libertarian movement this cycle. Do we focus on independents like Jill Stein, who seem to have gained some momentum, or I mean, what, what do you think pe Americans could do po post Trump America next? Cycle? I don't think there's anything. I don't think there's anything to do. Uh, it's right now the game is wide open, and um, as I said, if Trump doesn't deliver on his promises to his followers uh, who wanted a very, very different type of country and a very different deal for themselves. And if he doesn't deliver on that, 
we could be facing uh, something approaching a coup d'etat. We could be facing a real armed revolt from the right. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's just not clear as to what Trump is going to do, whether he's going to deliver on those promises, what the reactions will be, and so on and so forth. But in a sense, the experiment, the American experiment is over. We've just come to a dead end. And uh, I think democracy, such as it ever existed, is going to fizzle out. And the United States will limp along as a kind of irrelevance. Um, and I think that uh, it will be even more irrelevant eventually in the world than England is. Um, so I don't think there's anything, you know, to quote, decide, really. Um, it's, it's a question of uh, how these social movements are going to play out. And, um, and we'll find out. I mean, we'll, 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 we'll know within a few years uh, what the lay of the land really is. And if there's any last uh, point you'd like to mention, as well as uh, tell us perhaps about your books, where people can find more about your work and uh, what else you're working on. Oh, well, let's see. Um, I was gratified a few days ago, La Jornada uh, did an article which discussed uh, the book I did called Dark Ages America. It was published uh here in Mexico by Sexto Piso Editorial under the title Edad Oscura Americana. And uh, what they said in the article, I mean, I was very complimented. They said that, you know, Berman has been predicting this sort of thing for years now. And that was the second in a trilogy on the uh, American empire, the decline of the American empire. And all these books were translated by Sexto Piso and are available. The third in the series, the American title was why America Failed, and the uh, Mexican title, the Spanish title, is Las Raices del Fracaso Americano. Um, and uh, for fun, uh, unfortunately it's not translated yet, but I did a novel uh, published in February of this year called The Man Without Qualities, which is a satire on American politics that I think some readers uh, might get a kick out of. And... Um, you know, it's all on Amazon. Just plug into Amazon.com and you'll find it. Okay, and people can visit morrisberman.blogspot.com to, to continue reading your, your rants on there, which are uh, great. It's always a pleasure to speak with you, Dr. Berman. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.